Starting any business from scratch takes a lot of courage and patience. It's a lot of hard work. There is no guarantee in how it could turn out. Some risks are needed and some efforts will not pan out. <gasps> and the cost of not working out can be terrifying. Farewell paychecks. Paying monthly bills can suddenly look scary. The work never stops. That overnight success takes at least 10 years of hard work, which is why more than 45% of businesses fail in the first five years. And less than 25% of new businesses make it past 15 years or more. So why start anything from scratch? I used to be puzzled about this math too until I became an entrepreneur. It's a lot more fun, enriching, rewarding, and humbling than it looks. Yes, the risks are high, but so is the return. But what really goes behind the scenes? Today, we'll uncover all your questions on entrepreneurship and what it's like to build something from scratch. Hi, I'm Monica Kang, founder and CEO of Innovators Box, and you're listening to Curious Monica. Today, we're going to learn all about what it's like to start a business, why people do it, and what you may want to consider if you want to do it too. Listening, listening, listening. Leaders are going to have to really listen hard to understand what, what needs to change and how to implement policies and anything that they need to, that needs to change. A lot of people have great ideas. To be a great leader, you have to really listen and collaborate and be willing to change. Those skills are constantly evolving. Even now, we're, we're always think, figuring out what's the next thing. So I think a lot of the, the skill sets really are about that like creativity and adaptability to the market and being able to always come up with like, how do I best provide the solution that people would want? If I want to really make a difference, I need to listen a lot, learn a lot, and work a lot on myself. It's a lot of money to, you know, open a restaurant, especially on this kind of scale. So for eight months, we had no income. We're paying, we had to pay rent um, or had to, we have to back pay the rent, you know, um, for probably at least 12 months because of the pandemic. I get my phone bill at the end of the month, right? And if it hasn't gone up, guess what? I'm just gonna pay, right? I haven't seen it gone up, years go by. People don't realize that everything is negotiable when it comes to that. Whether it's a phone bill, whether it's an electric bill, whether it's a waste bill, that it's negotiable. I think first and foremost, the most important thing is trust. If you have that harmony, the synergy, that trust factor, understanding, Anything is possible. You can get through any of those hurdles, any of those challenges that can come your way. Welcome to Curious Monica. In today's episode, I want to talk about everything surrounding what it's like to be a full-time entrepreneur. It's humbling. At the end of the day, we all want to make a positive difference and contribution no matter where we work. And being an entrepreneur, a founder, and someone who started a business means you get to cement that foundation from the beginning. You set the why, the vision, the products, and the services. You get to play a role in making this world a better place by solving one pain point at a time. But this also means you're taking a lot of risk. You spend all this effort, time, and money to realize maybe people don't need your services they aren't paying enough to sustain your business, or that you'll burn yourself out in the process. Today, I'm going to ask friends who are in business outside of tech because tech is just one of many fields we work in. If you're curious about tech entrepreneurship, be sure to check out our Tech Entrepreneurs episode a few months ago. As we visit my entrepreneur friends in education, clean water, restaurants, sustainability, and staffing, I encourage us to stay curious. What is standing out to you? What surprised you? Because while what they do may differ, there are key lessons they share that all entrepreneurs will want to circle back to. By listening to these stories, I hope we can stop over-glorifying entrepreneurship and encourage more people to find the courage to start their business if they want to. Read more about their stories by clicking their names in our show notes. You'll want to say hello after learning more about how they got to where they are today. Lesson 1. 
Be curious. You never know where you'll get your business idea and drive. Well, no, this is not what I thought I was going to be doing. If you had told me a few years ago I was going to be a philanthropist, I probably would have laughed and said, you know what? This is like ridiculous. <laughs> Why? Why like, is it ridiculous? Me? No. I mean, not that it's, there's nothing, there's anything wrong with being a philanthropist. I just wasn't into things like clean water. That's something that I stumbled upon by accident. So, and then after getting into it, obviously I loved it and I'm still doing it. But the thing is, my career really was uh, supposed to be in IT because that's where my degree is, Bachelor of Science in, in Computer Science. So I started out working for companies like JP Morgan Chase and so forth as a software engineer. I did that for many years and finally got tired of it. And then in my search for something that was different, something that was more connected with the community, because I wanted to do like things that were more in touch with people. So I found myself doing philanthropic work. And uh, little by little, I just kind of gravitated towards that. I'm still doing, you know, IT stuff, but I'm not so much into, I don't do, really do much development anymore, like software engineering. I'm more into like managing projects and making sure that, you know, projects work a certain way, they deliver on time, no one is running late and, you know, making customers happy. Lumbi Milambo is a philanthropist and a founder and CEO of JB Dundolum a nonprofit organization that helps underserved and impoverished communities who struggle with the lack of clean water. But as she shared a moment ago, clean water wasn't something she thought she'd be getting into. Born in Zimbabwe, she moved to the United States 36 years ago and is now happily living with her family and two children in Texas. She was happy where she was. It wasn't until she made a visit to Zimbabwe for a project that she realized how important water is and why she wanted to devote her work to it. When I went to visit one of my projects in Zimbabwe, it was a clinic that I was going to help in uh, the rural area in Zimbabwe. And when I got there, I wanted them to show me where the maternity wing was, how many beds they had. They only had three beds. And I was there thinking that I was going to help them expand the maternity wing, rebuild the clinic, whatever. But to my surprise, they kind of looked at me like, that's not really what we want. They were actually negotiating with me. And they they told me that they didn't want a clinic. They didn't want a hospital. And that was a shock to me. It's like, what kind of person doesn't want a clinic? When people are dying around here, you tell me you don't want a clinic. And what they were telling me is that they wanted water, clean water. And I was like, well, okay, fine. I'll, I'll just go get water and bring it to you tomorrow and we'll be done. Then I can get on with the clinic. Little did I know that to provide water is a lot of effort. It takes a lot of, of things that, that have to come into that. Finding out where is this water going to come from? It didn't really matter when, when you, whether you dug or not. The water was still the same. It was contaminated everywhere. So in, in my case, then I had to work with like science and technology institutions to go in and test the water in the lab. Let me work with someone who knows what they're doing, who can just test and tell me, Lumbi, you need to do this, install a system maybe above the ground system and filter it, which is what I ended up having to do. And I kind of like that. Then after that, I kind of, it really dawned on me when people started drinking the water at the clinic, it really dawned on me that it was not just the clinic that needed the water because everybody in the community of 20,000 people came to drink the same water at the clinic. And that's when I realized that, you know, water is so important when we don't even realize it. It impacts a lot of people in different ways. And I little did I know that even here in the U.S., in places like, you know, Newark, New Jersey, and Flint, Michigan, they have that, that water situation. And I've been there to help them. We've been there. My, my organization has been there. And now here, right here in Texas, who, who, who knew? that here in Texas, we have that issue. And now we're helping in Texas as well. So water is everywhere and water impacts people everywhere, regardless of whether you are a, a well-developed country or an underdeveloped country, it's everywhere. The issues are everywhere. She found her passion in water because she was curious about why the people she wanted to help were saying that they did not want the clinic. Her drive to problem solve and altruistic nature helped her realize the gap in access to clean water. 
This led her to not only starting her nonprofit, helping people have access to clean water, but also becoming an advocate on this issue as the UN Global Leadership Award recipient. Curiosity can lead you to new paths, but you still have to take action and implement it to make the idea come to life. Kevin Felix Chen, founder and CEO of Best Delegate, a model UN program for youth to improve their public speaking skills, shares how strategy and execution is key to your business's growth. Lesson two, build a strategy, iterate, and execute it. Yeah, so, you know, using one of the frameworks just scaling up, most companies need to think about four things. So strategy, people, cash, and execution. And when those four pieces combine, that's when a company is able to scale up. But then when we're missing one of those pieces, it's going to cause like disproportionate pain in terms of the company, right? Either you don't have the right people on your team, or you don't have enough cash to scale, or you know the execution plans aren't just being worked, or all those things are there, we're working really hard, but then there's no strategy, so they're not really growing that, that fast. So having all those components in the right place and being aware that those things exist in the first place, I think when, when we're actually working in the business, we're like trying to to deliver the programs and, and, and not really focusing on that bigger picture. And so when I see all that, it's like, oh, this is the thing where moving that one lever, right? Hiring this thing or, or you know, investing cash into this marketing initiative, like these are the big levers that when moved uh, make a really big difference in growing a company. Becoming a sustainable business is not an overnight journey. It takes constant iteration and care. This is why as Kevin shares, when a business does not balance these four levers, strategy, people, cash, and execution, they fail. But how can you learn how to do it if you're figuring this all out for the first time? Kevin shares the balance of how you can work on your business and in your business, starting with trial and error. So in the early stages, it was trial by error. <laughs> a lot of like, you know, testing and figuring it out. And uh, like, like I said, listening to a lot of customer feedback, what we thought they wanted is not necessarily what they actually wanted or were willing to pay for. And then what we thought would work educationally may not necessarily be like the best. And we you know, iterate over time, right? The programs got better over, over the years. And then making time for that too is at some point, it's focusing on working on the business instead of in the business. So it's taking a step back from everything and, and looking at the bigger picture and thinking, okay, what do I actually need to do that's not delivering the actual pro program or service and to, to you know, take the company to the next level. Um, and a lot of that requires learning. You know, I was constantly learning, reading a lot of books, and then eventually realized, oh, I, there's programs out there that support entrepreneurs. You know, I joined Entrepreneurs Organization and the like, first Accelerator and then EO. Uh, I joined you know, Ace Next Gen, which is another nonprofit. So all these organizations are out there to support entrepreneurs to figure it out. And now that I've gone through that in 10 years, I realized, oh, there's actually kind of a proven process on how to build a company. And you know the raw materials are there. We just have to follow it. Yes. While a lot of people have folded their businesses, a lot of other people have succeeded too. There are a lot of great resources, communities, and tools out there that others have vetted that you can use too. Traction, playing to win, and who, for instance, are some of Kevin's favorite books that he often recommends to other entrepreneurs as they start their journey. And seeing that who you surround yourself with matters, Kevin's advice to seek out more places where you see other entrepreneurs like you, wanting to learn and grow to be a better entrepreneur is so important. The balance of working in your business and on your business is so crucial in this process. When we are too busy delivering our day-to-day -day work, we don't have a moment to take a step back and reflect on what we want to get out of this. So pause. Don't just work hard, work smart. That being said, what if your business partner is your life partner? Hedo and Nish Parikh, the co-founders of Rangam, have a staffing and recruiting company focused on inclusion and equitable solutions. Their philosophy of empathy drives innovation is inspirational, and they play a key role in staffing and recruiting inclusive, diverse talent for Fortune 500 companies in the United States. But having built their company for 25 years, I was so curious. How can you work well with your business partner who is also your life partner? Are there any disagreements? 
It's one thing to depart with your business partner if you don't work well. It's another when that's your family member. What do you do? Lesson three, build trust and respect with everyone you work with, including your business. As we look back and reflect back on our 25 years of our journey, right? We'll be celebrating our 25th anniversary. We just last November, we celebrated our, our company's 25th anniversary. So in fact, it's really interesting because I think in any relationship that you get into, whether if it's personal or business, I think first and foremost, the most important thing is trust. If you have that harmony, the synergy, the trust factor, understanding, Anything is possible. You can get through any of those hurdles, any of those challenges that can come your way. The trust and the respect. I think the second thing is respect. Respecting one another's differences, respecting each other's opinions, and then really coming to a conclusion on what makes business sense for us, for our business. And I like to treat the business as an individual and as a person. So my uh, wise advisor had told me that, Hethel, you have to look at your organization like a person, like an individual that you are raising. How would you cultivate? How would you nurture? How would you think about the best interest of that that individual, that person that is growing up to be a teenager and possibly going off to a college? And then raising two kids, obviously, you know, I always relate to all the experiences on the personal side and how we can actually learn from those experiences and apply them into our relationship, both on the personal and the business sides. See your business as a growing child. That puts things into perspective. No one, including our business, is a static being. It's constantly evolving and growing. And the more we take the time to learn, listen, and seek to understand, the more we'll have a chance to grow together. This is why Nish also shares how taking the time to learn about each other's strengths and weaknesses was key to grow better with Hetero at Rangam and also as a life partner. The two base bases, it starts with trust and respect. But then we go further. Second piece is understanding each other, each other's strengths and weaknesses. In our case, it took us a few years to figure that out, Our comp- and we are still figuring out each other's uh, strengths and weaknesses. And the key is, now, how do we leverage that? And step three is, how do we leverage that and so that we complement each other? And the most important piece is, where there is somebody's weakness, understand, and again, that's an empathetic approach, and then help the person manage in a, in a way It's true partnership, right? That's how in any partnership, other partnership in the business, partnership in life, it's pretty much these are all basic principles. And then the last piece at the top, which is most critical, is a communication. Expressing each other, expressing our feelings, our likes and dislikes, and making the other person aware so that there is a better communication and better harmony. Having strong communication skills and self-awareness is not only key to good partnership, but also key to all relationships you form. In business, you are always building and forming relationships. From clients to customers to fans to your employees. Entrepreneurs have to be extra mindful about how they speak, engage, and interact with everyone. The art of learning how to express how you truly feel hear how others feel, and find a way to work together across differences is so important. It takes practice, and it takes humility, and it's a key aspect of what makes an entrepreneur an entrepreneur. This is why when I caught up with Gary Huang, a co-founder of Gyoja, Japanese barbecue, a fast-growing restaurant that just opened at the wake of the pandemic in Rockville, Maryland, shares how he found himself being more intentional with all his communication. Gary is diligent, having dropped out of high school to serve in the army for six years, including one year in Afghanistan. He has both agility, patience, and persistence in all that he does. As a veteran, he has started several businesses in areas like social media marketing, photo booth setting, and now a restaurant. And each time, Gary 
shared with me how his humility and appreciation for people has deepened. Lesson four, care deeply about the people you work with, as well as those who you serve. Just at Guzo alone, we have uh, around 70 employees. And as a leader, we have to lead by example. What I've learned from the army is do not be a boss, be a leader. And what I mean by that is lead by example. I, I never ask my employees to do something if I'm not willing to do it myself. And when Guzo first opened, like um, my, myself and Derek, who is also my partner, we, we were busting tables. We were filling every role. We were busting tables, washing dishes, even cooking a little bit. Well, not me specifically, because you don't want me cooking. <laughs> but Derek ended up cooking back there. And, um, you know, we filled every role in the restaurant because we want, we want to lead by example. And I think that's what great leaders do is we lead by example and you take care of the people that you are leading. To build a strong business, Gary reminds us that we need to build a strong people foundation. He shares with me also how for many of his people, this is their first full-time job. He prides himself in finding people for their mindset and skill set instead of degrees and past experiences. Skills, he said, they can learn. Mindset is what's key. And perhaps because of this, he also shares something that I often don't hear a lot of leaders saying. He doesn't expect everyone to stay here no matter how much they enjoy working here. And I don't expect my team members at Guzo to um, stay with us forever because I don't want them to. Uh, I expect them to lead, eventually one day be leaders themselves and grow into those roles. I think that's what true leaders do is, you know, develop other people and help them grow out of their own shell. So, yeah, so that, I think that's the key thing to uh, making most businesses uh, successful is just having a core uh, foundation, which revolves around your partners and then your management team, and then definitely about who you hire and how you train them. Because most of our servers that are, you know, like one of our top servers, it's actually their first job. I never judge based on a resume. I judge them on their character, their willingness to work and hustle hard. And where I've gotten that skill to read people is, you know, from the army. I'm very good at reading people and see how they react based on how they talk, how they present themselves and their tone of voice. Plus one right here, Gary. At the end of the day, all business is built by people for people. And if we forget that foundation, what is this really for? Culture development in your business is key and something that takes a lot of effort. That being said, there is another stakeholder we must not forget as an entrepreneur. Oneself. Often, entrepreneurs are so busy working so hard that they forget to take care of themselves physically, emotionally, and mentally. The grind and hustle has led many to burn out in sleepless nights of exhaustion. But business is a marathon, not an overnight success. So taking care of yourself in the process is so key. Ariana Gomez, founder and CEO of Technology Impact in Mexico, shares how she learned this lesson the hard way. As a leader full of empathy, she knew how being able to understand others and her surrounding is one of her superpowers and what makes her business thrive. At the same time, early in her business, she wasn't sure how she could be both caring, yet not emotionally trained. She shared with me a story of her trip to Ethiopia when she was young. Lesson 5. Taking care of yourself is not selfish. It's essential. In fact, who will do what you do if you aren't taking good care of yourself? Yeah, that's, that's a very important question and important issue to, to consider. For, for everyone who's a very, you know, a super empath or someone who's just very empathetic and, and cares about others. And in my case, it's about keeping the eyes on the price, like trying to, to focus on the end result of what I want to achieve, which is the biggest impact possible. So if I get, I, I, I wouldn't like to say distracted because helping others and caring for others is never a distraction really. But if I get, you know, sidetrack because I get myself too emotionally involved. If I start crying and feeling bad and not wanting to leave my bed, for instance, how will I help others? How will I, you know, have impact in this world with the skills and the experience that I have? 
I think that has helped me a lot. Actually, when I was coming back, well, when I when I went back from Ethiopia to Munich, I was staying with my uncle and my and my aunt. They live there, and they are both doctors, and uh, and and they were also living in Africa many years ago. In you know helping communities uh, and you know they were flying doctors that sort of thing and uh, and my uncle was there and he was like what's wrong with you and I, I was just destroyed really because I felt so bad I saw a man you know he just he just died in front of me uh, in Menangesha in Ethiopia because he was just famished and 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 he was sick and and he, he didn't make it and so I saw a lot of also children, you know, that that were um, hurt because of the war and, and orphans because of the AIDS pandemic. It was really, really, it still is very uh, problematic in, in, in Ethiopia. And so I went back to Germany and I told them, you know what, I'm having trouble wanting to eat because, I mean, who am I to eat if I know there are children starving? Like, how could I? And I, I was just really confused, right? And and I remember he sat me down and he was like, you have a privilege because you have education and you care and you can prepare yourself to really do something about this. If you start eating today and you end up being really ill or if you die because you just, you know, don't eat anything, how will your life be of any service to anyone else? That would be selfish. That would be the selfish thing. And these were very hard words to swallow back then for me. But then today I think about that and I'm like, wow, I, I was always so grateful and I'm still very grateful for those words because it's true. So whenever I, I feel myself, you know, slipping into into sadness or, or really strong emotions that would actually preclude me from going on and keep keep going with what I'm I'm doing and what I know that I have to do in order to to create impact, then I just remember and and I remind myself that if I do that, then I would be selfish because I would be indulging in all these feelings and emotionality that will not make me feel better, will not make me able to solve that problem. So it's just selfish indulgence of those super hard feelings that are not good for anyone. And, and I remind myself that, and then I remind myself what I'm doing this, and then I just keep going. The lesson Ariana learned from that trip redefined what she thought being selfish meant. We have to think about the marathon, not the sprint. Is this why so many entrepreneurs I know seem to be wiser, kinder, and more forgiving and sharper the longer they run their businesses? They are thinking of the long run in everything they do, including in the relationships and business opportunities we build. Things will constantly change, and the pandemic has shown that if you only relied on in-person networking, you had to adapt fast to find a new way to build relationships and trust online. Still, what was even more important during this time for many entrepreneurs was a lesson that Dave Delicato found himself going back to again and again. Don't try to do everything by yourself just because you are the business owner. One thing about owning a business, and I always said this, and, and you think you could do everything. The hardest part, and the hardest part of me is reaching out for certain areas that, you know what, it's not my strong point. Understanding your strengths, your weaknesses, like people say that. Listen, as, as far as I want to think I'm, I'm, I'm my strengths are everything, it's not. There's things I need, you know, assistance in or more expertise. And so reaching out is one is, is the biggest part of owning your own business. Dave is a cost reduction expert and helps companies save unnecessary spending while optimizing their workflow for stability. As the managing partner of Schooly Mitchell in Connecticut, the former Wall Street veteran shares how it's been key to constantly innovate and stay aware that we can't be good at everything. It's just not possible. And that truth is both humbling and exciting. Lesson six, don't try to do everything alone. Go far with other people. The pandemic was difficult for Dave at first. As someone who loves to network in person, not being able to shake people's hand and say hello felt like an extreme halt to doing what he loves doing, meeting people. 
something he got very good at after working at Wall Street for 25 years. What do you do? You adapt and try to learn with others. You know, what's so funny is I'm old school when it comes to doing things. I'm a pencil and pad type of person. Uh, I love to write things down. I, I feel that uh, I learn and, and, and sort of uh, build that mindset when I'm writing things down and, and reading them back to myself. Uh, the environment is not that way. You have to be able to change, change in a good way. You know, it's just funny. Let's, let's see. So I'm a year or so, year and a half into my business, not even. And most of my business was face to face. So it was when I met a new client, it was, Hey, nice to meet you. Shaking hands, built that, uh, we built that relationships. And then, Hey, why don't we sit down for coffee? Why don't we sit down for lunch? Why don't we sit down for dinner? And it was perfect for me. Once the pandemic hit, I'll be the first to admit to it. I was like, Whoa. Nobody wants to meet you. I had tons of appointments canceled right off the bat. So there was a panic, right? What do you do? Oh my gosh. I mean, you've been in the business, you're a handshake, you're a traveler, you you like, what do you do? So instead of uh, folding up, I decided, well, I have to be a little more innovative. I have to be a little more creative. And I reached out to people. How are you meeting people? How are you running your business? Now, listen, people obviously, the most obvious, it's the, the webinars of and, and different platforms of your Zooms, of your WebEx. You know, how do we introduce that? Most people didn't I had no idea how to, how to log on, especially the clients that I was doing. I had no idea how to use that. So I became an instrumental sort of teaching them how to run their business from using these tools. And that's one area where it wasn't, you know, we weren't talking about what I do, but how can I be instrumental to them to run their business? So what I did the first few months is learn myself how to use those tools. And then obviously I became more alliance to them and, and, and shared those, those uh, learnings with uh, them. So that's how that, that went. You had to be a little bit more innovative when it came to how are you um, emailing? How are you running your networking groups? I relate to what Dave shares. At the beginning of the pandemic, I panicked as well. Everything we used to do at Innovators Box from business development to service delivery was all in person. How was I to survive? I wasn't comfortable being on camera, let alone have ever used to Zoom. Now, as I've gotten comfortable navigating remotely, I realized that's a skill I could use to help others. I was able to catch up with old and new friends as we helped each other navigate the changing landscape of the pandemic. That's how, Dave found himself not only getting more at ease with this new way of working, but also growing his business in the midst of the pandemic. We grew and expanded our capabilities, our online engagement, and our global outreach capacity as well, while all of our travel projects were on hold. So what's coming up for you? As the six friends share, starting something from scratch is a humbling, patient, and enriching journey. There is always something new to look forward to. There is always something new that becomes challenging. There is always something unexpected. But no day is ever the same, which makes it rewarding. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Hearing a bit about each of their journeys, what stood out to you? What are you hungry to learn more about as you start and build your businesses? The key is what you focus on and what you manifest doing. Every action becomes an opportunity to grow and learn. Thank you for joining us today. This is Monica Kang from Curious Monica, and I hope you enjoyed our conversations on what it's like to be a full-time entrepreneur. Let us know if you have any questions and what other topics you want us to cover at info at innovatorsbox.com. Next week, we'll be visiting more entrepreneurs, but this time, those who do it as a side hustle. How do they make time to do a business outside of their day job? And why do they do what they do? Join me at our next Curious Monica episode. This is your host, Monica Kang at Innovators Box. I'll see you again soon. Oh, hi, I'm Saren O, a creative producer at Innovators Box, and I hope you're enjoying Curious Monica. I adore learning about all the possible fields that people go into. Like I once met a girl in France who is moving to Copenhagen to fulfill her lifelong dream of becoming a professional chair maker. So amazing. This show is brought together by our awesome team, producer Saren O, audio engineers Sam Lambert and Ravi Ladd, Kelly Gravo on marketing, website designer Akriti Pandey, graphic designer Monica Escobar and Luke Helder on music. And of course, 
This show is hosted and directed by the curious woman herself, Monica King, founder and CEO of Innovators Box. To continue the curiosity and creativity of the workplace, visit us at innovatorsbox.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review, and share. We'd love to hear what you're curious about and what mysteries Monica can uncover in our next episodes. See you next week.